Thank you for listening to the show on Really Big Something Channel. December 19th, 2017. Did Trump politicize the Amtrak disaster yesterday in Washington State? So here is exactly what happened according now to the latest media reports. Roughly 7.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, a new train on a stretch of new track, a high-speed train going over 80 miles an hour. Now, that's too fast. I mean, right off the bat, I'm telling you, that's too fast. And so by going over 80 miles an hour on a particular stretch of track over a bridge, the train derailed. And then in unbelievable pictures, I'm sure most of you have seen them, one if not two of the cars of the train actually went over the bridge onto Interstate 5, crashing into cars and trucks on the road. When everything is said and done, over 77 passengers were injured. Six have been killed. Some of those injured, however, are in very serious uh, and critical condition. Now, it appears that there wasn't the high-speed technology available or installed either onto the train or onto the tracks that you see, for example, in Europe or Japan that automatically will slow a train down if it hits a certain speed. And so because there wasn't that kind of high-speed technology, it's one of the key reasons why, at least from the initial reports, why the train derailed, got off the tracks, and then went over the bridge. President Trump immediately said his thoughts and prayers go out, obviously, to the victims, but then said this. Roll it, Brittany. Let me begin by expressing our deepest sympathies and most heartfelt prayers for the victims of the train derailment in Washington State. We are closely monitoring the situation and coordinating with local authorities. It is all the more reason why we must start immediately fixing the infrastructure of the United States. So basically he went on to say, and look, he campaigned on this. This has been something he's been saying now for two years, that our roads, our bridges, our highways, our uh, railway tracks, our airports are, in some cases, as he put it, third world level, that they're crumbling, they're antiquated, they're broken down, and they need to be modernized, updated, and fixed. He has been making this point now for two years. In fact, it's one of the key pillars of his America First agenda to stop fighting in foreign wars or foreign lands and use that money and invest here at home. So it's not that the message was new. In fact, the message is something he's been pushing now, as I said, for the last couple of years, candidate Trump and even President Trump. And he also wants to push a massive infrastructure spending bill that he thinks will help rebuild our infrastructure and also, Trump believes, help our economy. The question is this. Did he politicize a tragedy? And let me be very honest with you, like I'm in the confessional. You know I like this president, I support this president, and I agree with his America First agenda all the way, baby. But I'm not going to stand here and be a hypocrite to you. When there is a shooting, a mass shooting, I can't stand it when politicians immediately run out and say, gun control, gun control, gun control. This is what the Democrats and liberals do all the time. The bodies are not even cold, and they're already trying to make a political point or push a political agenda. I think it's despicable. I think it's disgusting. Uh, we used to not do this in this country. To me, A, you should let 24, 48 hours go by for a period of mourning, number one. Number two, let's wait till at least we start getting some of the facts and what the causes were before we start already pushing our policy prescriptions, what preferred policies we want. 
And so, to be honest with you, if I was advising the president, I would have said, Mr. President, now is not the time to talk about fixing our crumbling infrastructure. Look, they're going to take at least another day or two to pull the, the, the bloody train off the tracks. This story's not going anywhere, okay? It's still going to be with us in two days and three days. So you want to make your point about crumbling or uh, decaying infrastructure? You can make it, but not on the day that it happened. Not on the day when they're still pulling bodies out of the train. Not on the day when you have people who are still fighting to be alive and being rushed to the hospital. You don't like it when it's done for gun control. Well, don't do it now when it comes for infrastructure spending. You're politicizing the dead. And to me, you should never do that. And so, to be honest with you, I disagree with him. I think he should not have said it at the time that he said it. Uh, and I think it's, in this case, it's no better or no different than when the left or the Democrats do it whenever there's a mass shooting or a gun massacre. Now, all of this being said, on the merits, I think he's right. On the merits, I think there's no question about it. And, you know, he's made this point, and it bears to be reinforced again. We have plunked $7 trillion. Let me repeat that. We have plunked $7 trillion, with the T dollars, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Libya, and all across the Middle East. We have been nation building all over the world, but especially to try to bring democracy to the Middle East. What have we gotten for it? Iraq is a disaster. Afghanistan is a bloody stalemate and still one of the poorest, most godforsaken societies on earth. Libya has essentially been taken over by either ISIS or Islamic militants, where actually slavery, I kid you not, the slave trade has come back to Libya. So this is what our $7 trillion got us. And yet, as we've spent $7 trillion in one war after another abroad and racked up a $20 trillion national debt, Look at our roads. Look at our bridges. Look at our highways. Hell, look at Logan Airport. I mean, really, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it should be the airport for Somalia or Sudan, not for the financial cultural hub of New England. I mean, look at those, look at the, look at Amtrak. I mean, is it me or is it like every four or five months some train derails on, 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 on one of these Amtrak trains? I mean, our, our railroad infrastructure is pitiful. Our airports are third world-like. I mean, it's like a third world airports. And so if we had spent $20 trillion, we're in the hole, $20 trillion of our national debt, and we had, you know, roads paved everywhere, modern highways, super highways, high-speed rail with the latest technology, first world airports like you see in Dubai or, you know, the United Arab Emirates or Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Okay, I'd say, listen, whatever, we're $20 trillion in the hole. But, you know, we've got a, 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 a massive military, We've got the best infrastructure, the best roads, the best airports, the best highways, the best railroads in the entire world. I'd say, okay, at least we have something to show for our debt. But what is to me unforgivable and to me is a damning indictment of our political and media elite, of our ruling class, our, the entire establishment, is that we are now the most indebted nation in the history of the world. Our military under Obama was gutted and hollowed out. We sent our sons and daughters to fight and die in these endless wars. We squandered $7 trillion. And our roads suck. 
I'm telling you, I don't know if I can make it till I'm 65. I've been saying this for a long time. Because whenever I drive, especially on 95, on 95 in particular, Route 1 is a little better, but still not the best. It's one freaking pothole after another. And I'm like, you know, my rear end keeps up and down on the seat, up and I keep hitting one pothole after another. I'm getting lower back pain because of all the freaking potholes in this city and in the state. I said this to Grace. I said, you know, I'm going to have a back operation driving on these mass roads. I'm going to have a, either a rear end operation or a lower back operation. Because uh, the, the, these roads are... De- the roads in Bosnia. I've been to Bosnia. They, they rebuilt that country after the war. The roads in Bosnia are better than the roads in Boston. So if we had a phenomenal airport, a new, modern, technological airport, if we had, you know, highways and modern bridges and high-speed rail, I'd say, okay, all right, we're $20 trillion in the hole, but hey, hey, look what we've got. You know, the corner man arrives in wor- at work and his rear end isn't hurting and my back feels great. But instead, we've got this. This is what we have. We took our treasure and we squandered it. We threw it away. And so on the merits of the issue, I think he's completely right. My only question is this. When you say to me, Jeff, do we have to rebuild the roads, the bridges, the highways, the airports, the railroads? All Yes, but the problem is how? Because we had a massive stimulus under Obama, and that was supposed to take care of the infrastructure. And a lot of it was siphoned off, and a lot of it was stolen. And so do we want another big dig? That's the question. Do we want another massive infrastructure boondoggle whereby so much of our taxpayer dollars is spent and apparently there's water running through the freaking tunnels? Last year there was a report there's water through the freaking tunnels. So, you know, one day the water just may fall on you and kaput. So, you know, is that what we need? So if there's a creative way that we can fix and modernize our infrastructure where there's real accountability, real transparency, where we know our taxpayer dollars is going for these projects, then I'm all for it. But if it's just going to be another trillion-dollar stimulus package, then forget it, because they're just going to steal it. So we're not going to be $20 trillion in the hole. We're going to be $21 trillion in the hole, and uh, the roads are still going to suck. 617-266-6868. 617-266-6868. Okay, double barrel question. Did Trump politicize the Amtrak derailment? Was he wrong to do so? And two, is he right on the merits? Do we need to fix or update our crumbling infrastructure? Lines are loaded. Lynn in Florida, you're up first. Go ahead, Lynn. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Lynn? <laughs> Well, we'll see. Um, I actually was on uh, Amtrak 188 um, on May 12, 2015, the other Amtrak that went double the speed limit on a curve and uh, basically <laughs> tipped over. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, we, we lost eight people, uh, 238 people on the train, eight people died, 46 critically injured. I was one of the very much injured. <laughs> and um, uh, Lynn, yeah. can, you, can you refresh my memory? Where was that again? Was that Philadelphia? It was Philadelphia, the Frankfurt Curve. Yes. yes, I remember. I remember that story. And um, we also went double the speed limit. Uh, we ended up by 50 feet uh, from five tanker trains full of oil that no one seems to talk about. Oh, my God. Yeah, so if anybody wants to look that back up, 50 feet uh, is how far we landed from five tanker, you know, not just five cars, five full tankers full of oil. Um, and there's pictures of that all throughout CNN, YouTube, everything. But what I'm saying is that as far as speed controls, this guy went twice, as, well, so almost three times the speed limit, um, basically uh, <laughs> on a curve. And just, you know, there should be a, you know, train, uh, got to have controls, no problem. Uh, every other country has uh, many different 
you know, speed controls, et cetera. And, you know, some of their trains go up to 350 miles an hour. But we also have to look at who we're hiring. Um, I happen to be an executive recruiter. Go on LinkedIn and see who we're hiring, where we're hiring from, and why we're hiring. Half of the people don't have the experience. I wouldn't hire them. Um, and then I did additional research for safety on the rails. No one knows how to get out of a train. So if I can tell you, when it's flipped over, it's in the dark, <laughs> which I was. There's nothing glow in the dark. There's no lighting. The door's shut upon impact. How do you get out of a train window? Uh, I mean, Lynn, what, do you kick it open? or? You would think that, and that's what everyone says. That's not correct. So basically, you, it, it, there's only two windows on the ceiling that are available, and if one's blocked, you have to find them in the dark. And then once you find one, you have to hold on to the seats that are now on top of you, hanging down. You have to have somebody lift you up. I had a broken shoulder. And you have to have somebody lift you up, and then you have to remember how to open it. And you actually have to peel off a piece of rubber around that. In an emergency, not one person knows that. And then the door shut upon impact. So you are literally locked in to a train, and no one knows how to open a train. Okay, so, like, there's a little bar that the conductor knows where the bar is, and you can open that lever, and that's how you get to it. Not one person in our train knew how to do that. So I'm just telling you, in a nightmare, you're in a box and not want, you know, there's no global awareness campaign on safety of the rails. There's no global awareness campaign. No one knows how to get out of a rail. You know, if that train's on fire, your kid's in there, how do you get out in two seconds? There's not one person that can ever tell me how to open a train window. Not one. And then when you get on the top of the train, (laughs) it gets even more fun because you don't know if the things are on fire, if they're electric, if, you know, if it's still power, and how do you get down? There's no slats down the side of... There's nothing. In 50 years, they can't figure out how to put anything down the side of a train. God forbid it flips. You get the choice to, you know, jump and hurt yourself more, get electrocuted, get on real rails. <laughs> it, 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 it's hell on wheels. And, and then we also have the, the challenge now of what's going on as far as uh, our chemicals. We had three derailments in three weeks. I don't know if you're aware of that. I didn't know it was that I didn't know it was that bad, but I know Amtrak's been having a lot of derailments. Well, we had three in three weeks. We had one in Polk County, um, Florida, that just derailed a, a, a sulfur car, and then we had the North New Jersey, which would derail ten, uh, twenty-one oil tanker cars. They happened to be empty, supposedly, um, but between CSX, uh, Conrail, and Amtrak, we've had three derailments in three weeks. That's incredible. And then we have this one fall, just by chance, onto a freeway. If it had been a 1,000 bodies, if it had been 3,000 bodies from that train hitting that freeway, would Congress make a move? Would someone make a change? And that's my, you know, being in an accident, I get upset. But, but uh, Lynn, Lynn, accident, I'm up, Lynn, I'm up against it, but I want to ask you a couple of questions. Can you just hang on? Sure. Is that okay? Okay. We're yeah. going to continue with Lynn, and I want to take more of your calls. 617-266-6868. Did Trump politicize the Amtrak derailment yesterday? Do you think he was wrong to do so? And on the merits, is he right? Do we need now to modernize and fix our nation's crumbling infrastructure? Your calls next. 127 here on the great WRKO. Okay, we were talking with Lynn from Florida. She is, in fact, a survivor of an Amtrak train that derailed the one in Philadelphia. It was a gruesome derailment. Uh, Lynn, thank you so much for sticking with us. I've got to ask you this question because you're making brilliant points about people don't know basic safety, how to get out of a train. God forbid if you get into a, a crash or an accident or get derailed. When you were on that train and you said what, you, your, 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 your shoulder was separated? Oh, I, I, yeah, I have, I have lots of issues. <laughs> I still have lots of issues. Um, and, you know, obviously PTSD and all of that. But, yeah, my, my total back shoulder blade, the, the big back one on your bone that only 1% of the people break. Yeah, basically I break my uh, shoulder I'm blade. Sorry and I had that. to climb out, and, and I had to climb out of the top of the train. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Lynn, what yeah, was going, I, I, when the train began to derail, yeah. what was it like to be in that train? What are you thinking? What are you experiencing? 
Um, well, you know, with, with our train, it just got faster and faster. And then, you know, basically we just felt like we were flying. And then basically I blacked out because my, you know, whole body went against the wall, I guess, at 110 miles an hour. So, um, you know, I, I was literally in rehab for a long time. So, um, <laughs> you know, still trying to get through different things and still I can't do certain things. So, um, you know, and there were people, you know, that, you know, crippled and, and people dead. I mean, you know, Eli Culp is a chef on our train. I mean, he's in New York. High on Hudson is a restaurant. Please go there. I always tell people go there. <laughs> you know, he's on my train. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a crazy, scary feeling. Um, but I think the scarier thing is the fact that, you know, nobody's doing anything and no one's reporting on this, and you're the first person to take my call, and I'm a recruiter, and I've been putting out tons and tons and tons of calls because three trains in, in three weeks, and no one seems to understand how big this is. If each train had, you know, been a 1,000 people that had died, that would have been, you know, huge. In, in Canada, there uh, is something called the Megantic Rail Disaster, and you can look that up. It blew up half the town and liquefied people. It, it, you know, we have oil tankers and oil tanker trains that are not secure, that are not safe, that are going in the wrong directions, wrong places. If that had been an oil tanker train over there, to, you know, is that going to be the next one we see? Lynn, do right? you think Trump is correct when he comes out and says we've got to spend a lot of money and completely fix and modernize our infrastructure, including our railroads? I... If there had been 3,000 people who died today or that, you know, a couple of days ago, um, yes, I'm saying that basically he needs to rip up all of our infrastructure and, and create safety. Um, we have no security. We have no cameras. We have, you know, no bomb dogs. We have, uh, you know, people can board trains without ID. It's insanity. And the more research I did when I wrote my book, I did write a book called Terror by Rail, but I, I wrote a book on it because, the more research I did, the scared, the more scared I became. That it is absolutely insanity. We are an archaic age that you can board a train without ID. In China, everybody has to give a visa passport. You know, I mean, it's it's insane. In the UK, they've come up with tons and tons of cameras and security, and and the infrastructure is broken. The security is broken, and basically every piece along the way is broken. And um, it's it's going to jump upon us very, very quickly. And I, I believe in my heart of heart, it already is. And, you know, we had, you know, a test drive for 9-11, right? We had a test drive. And then it happened. And then we acted and we got the airports and we got everything secured and we got the airplane doors secured and sealed within weeks, all fixed. I'm saying we need to act like this was as big as it could have been and act that rapidly to secure the, to secure the rails at this point. Lynn, and I, I need someone to take this on. <laughs> uh, Lynn, listen, I want to congratulate you for writing the book. More importantly, I want to congratulate you for rehabilitating yourself. And I am really happy that you're alive today. Thank you so much for that call. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Don't be a stranger. God bless you, Lynn. Thanks, 617-266-6868. Okay. We'll take more of your calls, I promise, 617-266-6868. But first, lawmakers are now on the verge of voting for an historic tax reform legislation. Evan Heidenrich has the absolute latest in the RKO newsroom. Evan, what's the latest? 136 here on the great WRKO. Paul in Georgetown, who I believe disagrees with me. Paul, yes, thanks sir. for holding and welcome. Go ahead. Thanks for taking my call, Jeff. I'm my pleasure. On you. I'm usually 100% behind whatever you say, but this time I have to disagree and I'll explain why. Okay. No legislation on earth would prevent a legal gun owner from going berserk and committing a mass shooting. However... Common sense and best, best, best business practices would prevent spending $180 million to get an increase in 10 minutes for the distance traveled and then running off the track. So you're, sa the, so you're saying, political. Paul, you're, you're saying that Trump was right to say we need to have speed controls, we need to develop our infrastructure in a way that would prevent something like this from happening. We need, if you want to go, if you want to have a rail system that runs 80 miles an hour, build one. 
Don't use the antiquated system and say you can run that fast on it. Don't spend $180 million to improve it, and you get you gain 10 minutes after $180 million spent, and you say, in an inaugural, an inaugural, this is the inaugural trip. What, what possibly could go worse? There was no common sense, no best business, business practices, excuse me, and that could have been prevented. However, you can't legislate someone going in buying an AK-47. Oh, no, no, I, Paul, on, on the Second Amendment, I agree with you a thousand percent. No, so my, was, my only was point was this. It was common sense. No, I agree with you. No, Paul, look, my only point was this. I'll, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, like I'm in the confessional. When I saw the president make his comments, I kind of, I grimaced. I was like, ugh, look, we don't know all the factors just yet. They're Can still dragging the thing? bodies. Hold on, Paul. One They're dragging the bodies out of the train. Look, you can make this point tomorrow. You can make it on Wednesday. You don't need to make it right now. Uh, I just, I don't, I'll be honest with you, Paul. I don't like it when a tragedy happens. And I agree with you. Look, it's antiquated. We need to uh, completely overhaul our infrastructure. On the merits, you're completely right. I honestly just don't like it. When I see any politician, I don't care from which party, talk about an agenda when the bodies are not even cold yet. That's my only point. I, I think if, if I were one of the people on the road who got killed, I would want someone speaking out right away saying, are you nuts? What were you thinking doing this? You knew this, this was going to happen. You can't, you can't possibly do what you attempted to do on an antiquated system, and it should never have happened. And I should be alive today. Uh, Paul, look, I got to tell you, uh, I think there should be an investigation. There will be, obviously, but there should be an investigation. I got to, to me, the other question is this. What the hell was the train doing going 80 miles an hour? The first person I'd ask is that mayor who said he called this. Why? What did he say? Bingo. What did he know? Bingo. Bingo. Paul, thank you very much for that call. I appreciate it. And, look, I'm not saying drugs were involved. Please don't take this the wrong way. But you've got to start thinking about this. When you have states that, you know, legalize marijuana, I mean, you know, I want to know. Was this guy intoxicated? Was he stoned? Was he drunk? Was he, you know, the, 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 the driver of the train? Because you're going 80 miles an hour, buddy. You're flying. You're flying. On on track, I understand that stretch of track was new track, I get it, but still, you were going way too fast. So why were you going so fast? And so, uh, look, to me, something smells. And you're right, the mayor said there was going to be a problem with it. A lot of people warned that this was not ready, the tracks were not ready to go this fast. So obviously they were rushing something, the so-called bullet train, because they're trying to push public transportation, but they don't want to do the necessary groundwork the, you know, to properly have a train system in place. And because of that, six people are dead, at least, and 77 injured. And that's why I found that call from Lynn in Florida, frankly, so fascinating. Because she's describing what it's like to be in a train accident. And what she describes is like a horror movie. I mean, you're going so fast that you almost feel like a train is flying. And then when there is a collision or whatever, it derails, or you hit the wall so hard, you pass out. And then you wake up, the train is upside down. I mean, just imagine that. Your shoulder is broken, your back is broken, your legs or arms are broken. And she's completely right. How do you get out of a train? I don't know how to get out of a train. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying I take the train all the time, but when I was in D.C., the Acela, I would take it quite often, you know, go up to New York for events or meetings or whatever. So I've taken the, uh, you know, I've taken the train. And she's right. You don't need ID. Anybody can get on. Security's incredibly lax. And, you know, she's right. When we, a car accident, we all know what to do. Even a plane. Say what you want. We all know what to do. But you're on a train. You don't know what to do. There's no awareness campaign. There's no nothing. So, you know, look, to me, there's no question about it. That $7 trillion that we spent, had we spent it here at home, it would be a very different country. Now, 
Trump was not just talking infrastructure because of the train derailment. He was also talking about infrastructure because it was the core or one of the pillars of his new national security strategy. And I've got to tell you, I've heard many speeches in my life, but that speech that he delivered yesterday in Washington, D.C. was, I mean, Reagan-esque. It was that strategy that he laid out was a Reagan third term. It was about pride, patriotism, putting America first. And he talked about our trade with China, especially being fundamental to our national security. He talked about securing our border as being fundamental to our national security. He talked about infrastructure saying, let's stop these endless wars abroad and start focusing on problems here at home. Again, part of his uh, uh, core to our national security. And then he mentioned, I think, two things that to me absolutely stand out. Number one, for the first time since Reagan, we have a president who understands the threat of communist China. That it not just menaces its neighbors, it is not just now trying to expel us from Asia as the great dominant power, but that China is out to destroy us and eat our lunch economically. That they're engaging in uh, intellectual property theft, in unfair trade, that they are deliberately now uh, doing everything they can to encourage outsourcing, massive trade deficits, that have been bleeding this country of millions of jobs and nearly 60,000 factories, that China wants to deindustrialize America, and it's been growing and its wealth has been amassing at our expense. And also, unlike Obama, he singled out the threat of radical Islamic terrorism. He was unashamed, unashamed, in pointing out that jihadism and Islamist ideology are fundamentally connected, and that it's time that the West lead not just a military struggle, but even more importantly, a cultural, moral, and ideological struggle against the threat posed by radical Islam. It was the very opposite of Obama's national security strategy. Obama, when he laid out his vision, it was all appeasement, the surrender of our national sovereignty, apologizing for America, uh, downplaying and even dumping on American exceptionalism. For Obama, it was a policy of capitulation. Capitulation to China, capitulation to Russia, and capitulation above all to radical Islam, ISIS, and the mullahs in Tehran. And if you noticed, this has happened this year, and hardly anybody has even taken note. Trump has won a major war. Under Obama, he kept referring to ISIS as the JV team. And this JV team rampaged its way through Iraq, large chunks of Syria, North Africa, they're now in Libya, and committing one of the great genocides of our time. And in less than nine months, Trump has utterly crushed and destroyed, defeated ISIS, their caliphate, both in Iraq and in Syria. And notice, he did this without putting large ground troops in Syria or in Iraq. And not just without heavy ground troops, he did it without starting a war with Russia, which was very possible in Syria. And he did it effectively and decisively. And yet the media won't even acknowledge, they won't even give him the recognition that this fundamental threat that has done so much to destroy and massacre and ruin the lives of moderate Muslims, Yazidis, Christians all over the Middle East, that it wasn't Obama who stopped them, it was Trump who stopped them. 
And then, unlike Obama, this is to me what's incredible. The media is trying to pin him as somehow being a puppet of Vladimir Putin. Yet it was Obama who appeased Russia at every turn. It was Obama who wanted to push the infamous reset. Well, listen now to Trump finally say China is our rival, Russia is our rival, Iran is our rival, and we are putting all of them on notice. America is back. Roll it, Britain. We also face rival powers, Russia and China, that seek to challenge American influence, values, and wealth. We will attempt to build a great partnership with those and other countries, but in a manner that always protects our national interest. Bingo. Bingo. And what Trump was essentially saying is this. Look, we're going to stand up to Russian influence or Russian aggression when it threatens our interests. And the same thing with China. But on issues where we have a common enemy or foe, whether it be in North Korea, whether it be in Syria before with ISIS or radical Islam, well, why can't we have ad hoc alliances to defeat a common enemy? Why do we always have to do the fighting and the dying? And in particular, Trump cited that we have face a common enemy, a common foe in Islamic terrorism. And so we talked about a call that he got from Vladimir Putin thanking him for the CIA sharing intelligence to the Russians whereby ISIS terrorist cells were planning to blow up an historic Orthodox Christian cathedral in downtown St. Petersburg. And now it's, you know, it's Christmas time or very close to Christmas time and preventing hundreds of hundreds of Russian Christian worshipers from being massacred. Roll it, Brittany. As an example, yesterday I received a call from President Putin of Russia thanking our country for the intelligence that our CAA was able to provide them concerning a major terrorist attack planned in St. Petersburg where many people, perhaps in the thousands, could have been killed. But while we seek such opportunities of cooperation, we will stand up for ourselves and we will stand up for our country like we have never stood up before. You would think that us helping the Russians prevent an Islamic terrorist massacre from taking place in downtown St. Petersburg, you think the media would at least say, good job. You think the media and the Democrats, at a minimum, would say, well, he saved God knows how many innocent lives. No, 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 no. You are not going to believe the reaction. I've got that story. Your calls next. We also face rival powers, Russia and China that seek to challenge American influence, values, and wealth. We will attempt to build a great partnership with those and other countries, but in a manner that always protects our national interest. Trump lays out a brilliant national security strategy. He is, to me, without question now, the most conservative president since Ronald Reagan. And what we're now witnessing in many ways is a Reagan third term. And so, as I mentioned, he talked about Putin calling him and thanking him, publicly thanking him on the phone for sharing vital intelligence about an ISIS terrorist cell that was plotting to blow up an historic Orthodox Christian church in downtown St. Petersburg during the Christmas season. Uh, killing perhaps hundreds, potentially hundreds and hundreds of Orthodox Christian Russian worshipers. You would think the media would say, bravo. No, 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 no. James Clapper, one of the key top people of the deep state and a big Obama lackey, went on CNN 
to say this is proof that Trump is nothing more than a quote-unquote asset of Vladimir Putin. Roll it, Britain. You heard the president's speech today. He calls out Russia and China, describes them as rival powers, rival powers to the U.S., but also says he wants to build a great partnership with them and then had all this friendly stuff to say about his phone calls with Vladimir Putin this week. Is that a contradictory message? Well, it is to me. I think uh, uh, this past weekend is illustrative of uh, what a great case officer uh, Vladimir Putin is. He knows how to handle uh, an asset, and that's what he's doing with the president. Uh, You're saying that Russia is handling President well, Trump as an asset? That's the, that seems to be the, that's the appearance to me. Uh, this guy's a real scumbag. I got, he's a real bottom feeder. I got to tell you that. I mean, that first of all, that perjurer who lied under oath to Congress, but let that go about how they were spying on all of us, and he wouldn't admit it? Well, not willingly. Anyway, th this, this guy who s helped set up the NSA spying program, this guy who was a shill for Hillary Clinton, this guy who sold us down the river to the Iranian mullahs, and now he stands there and effectively accuses Trump, listen, of treason. This is McCarthyism on steroids. So I want you to think about this. He's accusing the President of the United States of being an asset, i.e. a spy for Vladimir Putin. And this was the head of intelligence under Obama? Are you freaking kidding me? Are you kidding me? So now Trump is a spy for Vladimir Putin. And, you know, this is not some crazy columnist that the Boston Globe making this accusation. This is Clapper, the former director of national intelligence under Barack Hussein Obama on CNN. So I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this. They would rather that we not even give intelligence to the Russians to prevent an Islamic terrorist attack on an historic Orthodox Christian church. By the way, St. Petersburg is the second biggest city in Russia. Okay, it's sort of like their, I don't know, their New York. Okay, Moscow's their Washington. St. Petersburg is their New York. By the way, it's the most beautiful city in Russia. It's stunning, okay? But let that go. And have hundreds of dead Russians. You would rather we don't share the intelligence and let the Islamists carry out their attacks than to what? Share the intelligence? And by the way, say what you want about the Russians. They listened. When our guys gave them information, they said, Ah, ah, da, 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 thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. When they shared intelligence to us about the Tsarnaevs and the Boston Marathon terrorist bombers, when their FSB told us these guys are going to Chechen training camps, these guys are Muslim fundamentalists and Islamic terrorists, you need to bring them in. Our FBI dropped the ball not once but twice. The Russians warned us not once but twice, and we didn't listen. And because we didn't listen, Four people died, and over 64 people were maimed and mutilated, hundreds injured on that fateful day. So, Clapper would rather that the Russians do what we did when it came to the Boston Marathon bombing. Do nothing, and let innocent civilians get slaughtered. That's the mind of the deep state. That's Trump derangement syndrome 617-266-6868 did trump make a mistake in sharing vital intelligence with the russians and maybe obama's worst scandal that story your calls next the voice of boston is you on 680 WRKO Boston, an iHeart Radio station. It's 2 o'clock.